Thanks, Hafez. Uh, the, the American Academy of Pediatrics, if I'm not mistaken, their definition is uh, is slightly different. I'm just going to quickly, uh, quickly going to just see if I have their definition. Um, it's just not letting me do that. Hang on one second. Yeah, the American Academy of Pediatrics is more than 20 seconds or less than 20 seconds with bradycardia. This one of more than 15 seconds or less than 15 seconds is what we seem to use more in the anesthesia literature. And like I was saying, the pe what periodic breathing is, it refers to is, is when they breathe and they pause for less than 10 seconds and then get rapid shallow breaths. So um, it's, it's something that is, uh, that is common. And um, as we get closer to term as a baby, our, our tendency to have spontaneous apneas decreases. Um, but if we get an infection or drugs such as opioids, it can cause uh, a recurrence. So um, one of the um, one of the things that we we see newborn babies for is is hernias. Okay, it's very common to see hernias, and hernias are much more common in preterm babies. So what what we see is is um, is newborns coming in often they go home from hospital and then a few weeks later or they'll come in for their hernia repair um, and so the more preterm they are the higher the risk of hernia and the higher the risk of retinopathy of prematurity obviously um, so um, we don't really know what these episodes mean. There, there is concern that they could be harmful to the developing brain or damage the gastrointestinal tract, uh, but we don't have any data to support this. But we err on the side of treating these episodes. So um, if you ever go into a NICU, um, they're very strange places. To me, they, they look like a, a pet shop where the parrots all have their cages covered because it's always dark. They always have the, the um, beds covered. And um, a lot of these children are on caffeine um, infusions and caffeine is is one of the drugs we know that stimulates breathing in, in this age group so a lot of these babies get caffeine uh, until their breathing gets more regular um, and um, caffeine is a drug we sometimes can use in anesthesia as well um, so the bottom line is what is an apnea well I use I guess the anesthetic literature uses more than 15 seconds or less than 15 seconds associated with bradycardia because we think if the apnea long enough to get a drop in their heart rate, it must be significant. What does it mean for the baby? We don't know, but it, but we, we fear that it, it, prolonged apnea and, and hypoxemia uh, can cause the damage to the, to the developing brain. So the incidence is about 12% after minor surgery in ex preterm infants. So that's, that's pretty high. I mean, that's, that's like uh, one in, uh, almost one in eight and the most common operations we see these children for are hernia repair and laser photocoagulation for retinopathy of prematurity so like I was saying the more preterm you are the greater your risk of these two uh, conditions which which require surgery and an anesthetic so um, the risk factors for post-operative apnea Really, the main one is the age of the baby, the post-conceptual age. So the post-conceptual age is the gestational age plus the postnatal age. Now, um, in the literature, they're saying we shouldn't use the term post-conceptual age anymore. We should use the term post-menstrual age, which I think is adding two weeks to the post-conceptual age. I don't really understand why they want to do that. Um, in all their literature, we still are using post-conceptual age. Uh, um, so it, it, I just mentioned it in case you look something up and you see postmenstrual age. It's a little confusing. Um, the most important risk factor, though, is how, how young is this baby? Uh, and um, this is where it gets a little muddy. So if we look at a healthy child with a postconceptual age of greater than 60 weeks, meaning if the child, say, was born at 40 uh, or 36 weeks and now they've been alive for 14 weeks, their postconceptual age is 60 weeks, we can send them home with standard discharge criteria. If it's less than 46 weeks, they should be admitted. And then 46 to 60 weeks depends on their comorbidities. So using 60 weeks as your cutoff for discharge is very conservative. And I'll talk about that on subsequent slides. But if they're basically, if they're preterm, that's a risk factor. And the more preterm they are, the higher the risk. So if they're, if they're like born before 32 weeks, they're very high risk. 32 to 36 weeks, they'd be moderate risk. 36 weeks and above low risk and you know after sort of 37 weeks technically their term and the risk is very very low if they've been having apneas at home so if mom says yeah they've stopped breathing a few times at home then they're they're high risk 
if they're anemic, is it's another risk factor. So um, causes in, include an impaired um, erythropoietin response, shorter red cell survival, and frequent blood sampling. So these babies in the NICU are getting blood draws all the time, and uh, that's um, one of the reasons why they can get anemic, because remember, they're only small babies, and they don't have a lot of blood volume. So if we keep doing blood tests, this is a, um, a risk factor for anemia. Uh, the, and there's no evidence giving a blood transfusion reduces the incidence of uh, apnea. But the recommendation strongly is if it's an elective surgery, we should delay it until hemoglobin is greater than 100. So what this means is if, if the, someone brings in a baby for um, hernia repair and, and they want them to go home and the hemoglobin is less than 100, we should um, send them home on iron, bring them back in a couple of weeks and do it then. Hernias do strangulate if they're inguinal and they do need to be fixed, but it's not an emergency. Uh, so, um, you know, we can send them home for a week or two on iron, and bring them back when the hemoglobin is 100 and, and reduce that risk. That is, uh, that is what the, the guidelines recommend. Um, I guess um, it, it gets a little grey as to when the, the, the hemoglobin becomes the major risk factor. Certainly if they're a term baby, the anemia is the major risk factor because term babies have a very low risk if they're not anemic of apneas. But if they're preterm, it's the prematurity in their gestational age that is the main risk factor, and anemia is a secondary risk factor. So if, if I have a baby that, that say, was born at 32 weeks, they're now, they've gone home, they're coming back, they're only 37, 38 weeks corrected, uh, I'm admitting them anyway overnight. So I don't really... Uh, I don't really need to see a, um, a hemoglobin because I'm keeping them in either way. But if, it, if it's a baby that's born at 37 weeks and they're now, um, they're now 42, 43 weeks uh, and you know, it's, it's possible they might go home because they were term, I, um, I would want to see a, a, a hemoglobin. I mean, check if your, your departments have policies on this, but for the most part, most of our hospitals, I think the policy is usually between 44 and 48 weeks. They can go home, depending on the hospital, if they're full term, and if they're preterm, somewhere between 52 and 60 weeks. 60 weeks is very conservative, but it's safe, very safe. About 52 weeks, I think it's still looking at a 1% risk of apnea. So um, this is something that we don't see a lot because we're not doing them all the time. But depending on, on the, the hospital, a big hospital with, where they have a big NICU and a good pediatric surgical service, these are the hospitals you're going to see these babies. So the other risk factors, if they, they have neurological disease, so if they've had intraventricular hemorrhage or arterial venous malformation is a risk factor. Chronic lung disease, uh, so these children are thought to be high risk, uh, particularly if they were on oxygen um, and the duration of supplemental oxygen, how many days they were ventilated for, that is all supposed to increase the risk. But I just want to stress, these are not the major risks. The major risks are the, 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 the gestational age one and the anemia two. And you know three is if we give them fentanyl or morphine. Even fentanyl, it only lasts 20 minutes, but it increases the risk of apnea significantly in that first 12-hour period. If they're actually, interestingly, if they're small for gestational age, that seems to be protective. So they did a study looking at apneas, and they found that if the child was small for gestational age, so they were a small baby, but um, they were um, they, they were growth retarded, it was protective. Um, it's thought that uh, the theory behind this might be that um, these babies are stressed in the uterus. They get in a lot more steroid released and their lungs develop better. Um, but we don't really know why, but um, that's just, a, just a, a reverse protective factor, if you like. So how do we predict our at-risk babies based on gestational age? Well, uh, Charlie Cote, who's a very well-known pediatric anaesthetist, um, did a, did a, a, a study in, in 1995 where they – they looked at all the evidence and all the studies out there and they plotted into some statistical predicting machine um, with things that I never really understand and they plotted a graph and I think I might have an image of that graph here but basically what they found from their predictions were that if the child is less than 35 weeks, uh, the incidence of apnea following hernia repair did not fall below 
until they got to 48 weeks post conceptual age and below 1% until they got to 54 weeks. So what that means is if they were born before 35 weeks, uh, they, there was a 1% risk until 54, uh, after 54 weeks. So one in 100 of these kids are still at risk of apnea. If they were less than 32 weeks, you needed to wait 56 weeks to get to that 1%. Now, is 1% uh, good enough? Sorry, uh, I missed your question, Dia. Um, you're asking uh, what's the EPO response. You're, I think you're, you're referring to this previous um, previous slide. So what, what that's saying is what, why are these babies anemic, particularly the preterm babies? One cause is that erythropoietin, EPO, they don't seem to respond as well to erythropoietin when they are preterm. So normally in a normal baby, um, they get erythropoietin released and uh, produce red cells, particularly um, you know, when the baby has been born for a, a little while. You know, they switch over from fetal hemoglobin to adult hemoglobin and they lose some red cells. And that normally happens uh, when I think when they're somewhere between four and eight weeks of age, uh, that starts to happen. But if they're born preterm, they could be alive for those four weeks and, and that change starts to happen. But they don't respond as well to the erythropoietin to produce the adult hemoglobin. And so they can get anemic. And it's very common for these babies to need transfusion in the NICU. And they also seem to have a shorter red cell survival. And as I mentioned, we take lots of blood from them. So there's lots of reasons. Like any adult ICU patient, they also are also chronically sick, and so they have um, more um, uh, anemia. Does that answer your question? Okay. So, um, yeah, so basically you can see from this, though, just these two lines that if you're 32 weeks, you've got to wait longer, 56 weeks, to reduce your risk. Uh, and look, 1% risk, that might be acceptable. Um, and that, again, it depends on the hospital. So this is just uh, that graph I was telling you about. And I just put it here to, just so you can get some idea. The, the y-axis looks at the probability of apnea. Obviously, one is 100%. Post-conceptual age is, is the x-axis. And if you look, say you take a baby... Um, that, and, and then these lines determine the gestational age. So you can see the risk is obviously higher for the babies born earlier. This arrow is running along 28 weeks. So say you take a 32-weeker, which I, I guess in Palestine would be uh, not uncommon in a, in a, if we have a preterm baby. So we say, okay, they were born at 32 weeks. So we're looking at this line. And, you know, these kids might go home by 38 weeks if everything's good. So they go home here. And then in a month, the surgeon says, look, I, I want to operate. They're now 42 42 weeks, so they're here, and you say, oh, okay, 42 weeks, what's their risk? And you, you plot this graph and you go, oh, boy, that's like 40%. That's that's pretty pretty high. So you can see uh, if you buy into this, um, again, I just want to r remind you, this is, this is extrapolated. They've done some complicated statistical calculations, and I read this article, and to be honest, I didn't really understand it, but I understand uh, pictures because I'm simple. Um, but the bottom line is, and and these are, you know these risks are not obviously absolute, but the thing to remember is they're higher risk. So it's just useful to keep the curve in mind and say, okay, you know, this this kid really like I, I re if I want them my risk to be really low, I've got to wait all the way here to to get like a, if you look at point one, you follow it here, it's 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 way out here. So so um, this is. This doesn't mean we don't do the operation. It just means that if we are going to do the operation, we need to be aware that there's a significant risk of apnea and we keep this child in hospital. Um, so this one is um, the probability of apnea looking at post-conceptual age. Um, I'm just trying to remember what this one is. Oh, yeah, okay, this is, this is um, when they leave the recovery room. So this one is, I think, all up. Uh, all patients by gestational age, and this is the probability when they leave uh, the recovery room. So if, if they didn't have recovery room and they, they didn't have anemia. Um, so um, so you can see they fall into this, this, this category here. And um, if basically what I think that suggests is if they don't have an apnea in the recovery room, uh, then... Um, the risk of apnea afterwards is much, much lower. So we do usually see these apneas early, but um, 
uh, they say that if they if they apnea in the first six hours, the risk of them apnea, and most apneas do occur in the first six hours, the risk of, of apnea in the next six hours is higher. Whereas if they don't apnea in the first six hours, the risk is very low. So um, what that suggests is that uh, 12, 12 hours of monitoring should be enough. If there's no apnea for 12, we can say, okay, we can stop monitoring. And if they apnea in the first 12, we need to continue for 24 hours. So, and I think I'll come back to that. Uh, but I just want to touch on term babies because of, we're saying the risk is high in preterm babies. So what evidence is there that term babies are at risk? They've only been included in some of the studies on, on apnea. And um, in 240 uh, prospective babies and 63 retrospective babies, they only had one apnea and they didn't specify the post-conceptual age. That is how term, whether they were 37 weeks, 41 weeks, they didn't say, uh, they, sorry, they, they, they just said they were term, they didn't say how many weeks they were born at, and they didn't say how many weeks after birth this apnea occurred. So we don't really know. But basically, it's it's um, very low. There's essentially been three case reports of post-operative apnea in full-term infants with post-conceptual ages of 39, 44, and 42 weeks, respectively. So that's three case reports, and that's not very many. And um, there's, for some of these, there were there were sort of reasons like like um, the, the kids. Uh, um, I, th I remember reading that one or two of the kids had some other things going on, whether they were sick, they weren't completely healthy. So, so the risk seems to be very low, but we can't quantify it because it's so rare. So um, the authors of this um, review suggested 45 weeks as a cutoff for day surgery. And then, um, and that way you'll cover the latest reported apnea because you can see here there was one apnea at 39, one at 44.5 and one at 42. So they say, okay, we know we had one at 42. Let's make our uh, 45 weeks be the cutoff for day surgery, meaning that if they're over 45 weeks, we can let them go home. And, um, and that's, um, that's basically um, covered because we we know it, you know there was at least one at forty four point five weeks, so that's why I think some hospitals use forty six weeks for term babies. So Ruba has a has a question. Uh, sorry, Ruba, would you, what is your question? Do you want to switch on your your microphone? Yes, I want to ask about. Uh, like the hernia, the one hernia surgery. Uh, if, the ba if the baby is about 34 or 35 gestational age, uh, so the recommendation is to wait until when to operate. So um, yeah, it's a little grey. I mean, uh, meaning that I don't think it's look. It's, there's no hard and fast rules. What we know is, if the baby was born at 34 weeks, usually. Um, they're going to go home. They, um, you want to make sure that they're well before they bring them back in. Uh, a lot of the time, I've done a few of these, they're still inpatients. And obviously, if they're still inpatients, it's not a huge deal because you're keeping them in hospital anyway. Uh, I say it's not a huge deal in Australia because it's relatively easy for us to arrange monitoring. Um, the issue is um, there's no way if, if, if they're 34 weeks gestational age and they, the surgeon, say, at 38 weeks wants to do it, they're not going home. That's a fact. So the question is, can you get reliable monitoring? And I'm going to talk about, I think, on the next slide uh, or the slide after uh, the type of monitoring you have. But the problem with hernias is they do strangulate within two to three weeks of diagnosis. There is an incidence of strangulation. So you don't want to wait too long, but it's reasonable to let them go for something that is correctable. So if, if it's anemia, it's correctable to say, okay, um, we, you know, we can put this kitty on iron for a couple of weeks and... Um, and then bring them uh, back in at a later, um, you know, a later date uh, uh, within, let's say, a couple of weeks. The problem is if they're 34 weeks gestational age, and you, you, let's go back to that, that graph, um, we have to say, okay, 34 weeks, so the gestational age, I think this, this top one is, is 36 weeks, so even if we use 30, uh, 36 weeks, they, 34 weeks and the surgeon wants to operate at 38 weeks, their risk of apnea is still very, very high. So the problem you have, though, is you can't – if they diagnose the hernia at, say, 36 weeks or something, you don't want to be waiting months because you, there's a risk this child will come in in the middle of the night with a strangulated hernia and then you've got an emergency on your hands. So I think they basically um, – 
say, you know, correct the other things, like if the child has some lung disease or, you know, those things, let the child get better over those and then you would do it. You would still do it um, in this in this range with a apnea risk, but you just have to keep them and monitor them. So you wouldn't not do it because you can't really – can't wait till they're 60 weeks because it's, it, there's a very high risk of a problem with the hernia. So that's that's. Um, so what I'm saying is, you might postpone a week or two if there's a lung issue or, or something that's correctable quickly. But um, you have to do them and you just have to monitor them. And I'll talk about possible techniques um, on the next slide to try and minimise the risk. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. So, uh, so, what can we do to try and minimize or mitigate the risk? Well, they're very sensitive um, to effects of opioids. So, the, the ideal is avoid opioids. Um, basically, um, that's that's generally um, uh, what most people would suggest. Don't give them any opioids. Muscle relaxants are long, last longer in babies. So, when you look up muscle relaxants in newborns, they are uh, they they might need um, a slightly bigger induction dose, uh, but then they last longer. So, what what I tend to do is, and most of my colleagues tend to advise, is underdosing them a bit. So instead of say if you're using um, rocuronium instead of 0.6 per kilo, you might use uh, 0.3 or 0.4 per kilo. And um, <clears throat> regional um, anesthesia is a, um, is a good technique. Uh, so whether or not you use muscle relaxants, I think I'll talk about in a minute, but regional anesthesia is a good technique. And can be used as a sole technique, uh, but they have to be pretty small. I've never done it, but you can do these cases under caudal or spinal, uh, and um, and the surgeon, you need a cooperative surgeon, obviously, but they need to be small. They need to be like less than three kilograms. By the time they're coming in at, you know, 42, 44 weeks post-conceptual age, they're going to be probably too big to do that. So these are more the ones that are still in hospital. They're still in the NICU. They're coming down, and you put a caudal in, and, and the surgeon does it that way. Um, so... Um, but you can certainly use regional anesthesia in conjunction with general anesthesia to avoid giving any opioid. So my technique uh, is to give um, to give a, a GA and a caudal, and then I run them on very little volatile. Um, I think there is some evidence out there to say it doesn't matter whether you give them half a MAC or one MAC or whether you give them a 20-minute anesthetic or a one-hour anesthetic there is still a risk of apnea. So some people argue, well, there's no point putting a caudal in because um, they're still going to have a general anesthetic and they're still going to have an apnea risk. I feel more comfortable if I can get a caudal in because then I can run them with very little anesthetic and, and they'll breathe better at the end. They'll breathe earlier, at least get them breathing. But unfortunately, they, they still do carry an apnea risk in their recovery room and, and, and postoperatively. Uh, so my management is basically I, I breathe them down with sevoflurane. Um, I, I put a tube in unless it's a very, very short procedure that they're having. But if they're having a hernia, usually I'll put a tube in. Uh, I let the child spontaneously breathe, but our ventilator has pressure support. So I, I, I let the ventilator help them breathe so they don't get tired. And uh, sometimes I will paralyze them. And the rationale for that is if I paralyze them, I can give them almost no isoflurane fluorine and they're still going to um, uh, they're, they're not going to move um, because I've got some relaxant on board and they've got analgesia they've got the caudal and I'm not worried about amnesia because they're not going to remember it so that's my rationale but some some uh, some books you look up will say don't give them relaxant I think in uh, we have um, in Australia any of Shugamidex that we can give to reverse the muscle relaxant I think the, re the rationale for not using muscle relaxant is in case there's a bit of residual paralysis in these kids, and obviously that increases their risk of respiratory complications. So um, whether you paralyze or not, I don't think is um, essential. Um, the other reason I paralyze often is if, if the, uh, when you intubate these babies, they desaturate fast, as we talked about yesterday, and if you intubate them and you, you don't get the tube in straight away, 
there's a you know it's good risk they get a laryngeal spasm and it's messy. So that's the other reason I sometimes will uh, paralyze them. The key is when you ventilate them, avoid too much ventilation and hypocapnia because um, that can lead to prolonged apnea at the end of the case if the CO2 gets too low. So I tend to run the CO2 a bit on the high side and hopefully let them make their own respiratory rate. And um, uh, if, if you let them get too hypoxic or too uh, hypercapnic, that is from inadequate ventilation, they can get reversion to a fetal circulation. So you just have to kind of be fairly careful with your ventilation settings. Other drugs we can give, um, caffeine, 10 milligrams per kilogram, is effective at preventing apneas. So they say you should give that over 10 to 20 uh, minutes during the case. And some people would say it's recommended for all ex preterm infants with a post-conceptual age less than 60. It's a little con controversial because um, not everyone may need it. You know, the, the risk might be 40%, say, um, you give caffeine to everyone and 60% of kids are getting caffeine and they don't need it. And there are side effects. Um, you know, I mean, if you think if you have one cup of coffee, it can stimulate you a bit. And one cup of coffee has about 100 grams of milligrams of caffeine in, which is a little more than one, one milligram per kilogram. We're giving 10 times that. So we're giving like seven cups of coffee. And you see these babies sort of startle when you put the caffeine in, they get tachycardia. And we don't know what other cerebral effects it has. So um, it, some people would say they, they do only give it to the highest risk. Other people give it almost to everyone. There was a Cochrane review. Um, you know, the Cochrane database is, is a very respected database for reviewing topics. And they looked at caffeine use. And there's not a lot of studies out there, but they found number needed to treat of two. So if you have a high-risk baby and you give caffeine, and you give it to two babies, you'll prevent an apnea in one baby. So that's fantastic, and that's why a lot of people recommend caffeine. But, but if they have an apnea, what does that mean? I mean, is it harmful? We don't know. So, so some people would say you should use it judiciously. Don't give it to everyone. And again, there's no hard and fast rule. So, you know, if their child is very high risk and you, you think of that graph and you say, look, they have a risk of, of like 0.6 or something probability, you know, maybe that's the one you're going to use it on. Uh, versus um, versus the kid that's like born at 36 weeks and you know has been very well. Uh, Methylxanthine is another drug that has been used, um, but caffeine is is safer. So this is the Cochrane review. Um, so they say, in view of the small numbers uh, and the uncertainty, considering how significant these in, in, this clinical significance of the episodes are, it's it's good to be cautious. Basically, that's just what I was saying before, and that's just the reference there. So um, monitoring. So in, in, in a healthy ex preterm infant, six hours should be sufficient because the first apnea, as I was saying, usually occurs in the first six, even the first four hours. If they have risk factors such as anemia or severely preterm or they've had a history of apneas at home or you know, respiratory disease or neurological disease, then, then they say we should monitor for 12 hours. Uh, and if apnea occurs within that 12-hour period, we should extend the monitoring to 24 hours or at least 12 hours after the last apnea. So if they had an apnea four hours after and you do 12 hours after that and they don't apnea again, you could stop the monitoring. So what is this monitoring I keep mentioning? Well, they say ideally we would do continuous pulse oximetry monitoring, ECG monitoring uh, with nursing observation. There is a monitoring called a pneumocardiography, uh, but it's a bit more complicated. And, and there's also things like respiratory impedance monitors, and in stu different studies they've used different things. But the reality is most of us don't have these fancy monitors. We just have pulse oximetry, we have ECG, and people understand those. They don't always understand these um, other more fancy devices. So uh, in summary, if you can postpone until the, the post-conceptual age is greater than 60 weeks, we should. But as I was saying, for hernia or retinopathy or prematurity, we, we can't. If it's something like an extra digit on the child's finger, then absolutely, that's not urgent. We can do that later. Ideally, they should be done in a tertiary pediatric center that's used to doing these cases. We should assess them for comorbidities. And it, again, if the hemoglobin uh, is less than 100, we should, should try and get that up. We avoid opioids. If we can do a regional, use it where possible. If we can give caffeine, if they're high risk, we should do so. 
and uh, if they're less than 60 weeks, um, they should be admitted and monitored for at least six hours if they're well. Uh, and um, if, they're, if they're not well, obviously, we monitor for longer. And uh, for the term babies, um, if, they're, if they're more than um, – uh, for term babies, uh, more than 46 weeks, uh, we, we would um, we would admit them. Um, so this this last line is a bit confusing, but basically, if they're over 46 weeks, we should monitor for 12 to 24 hours if they have comorbidities, or if they're less than 46 weeks gestation is what it's saying. So if you have a completely well child, um, then uh, um, you know you, 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 the, the duration of the monitoring is, is less because the risk is lower. Um, but basically, um, that's post-operative apnea, and, and um, I just wanted to slip that in because this next, this is the rest of last night's talk, but uh, it, it's 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 relevant to some of these um, neonatal cases. Are there any questions on the post-operative apnea? Uh, I actually have a question, not about uh, post-operative apnea, but uh, about um, fever and upper respiratory tract infections and lower respiratory tract infections and leukocytosis in pediatric. Uh, we always have um, this controversy about uh, uh, operating on uh, these children who have leukocytosis, leukocytosis or upper respiratory tract infection. Yeah. So I want to know the exact um, guidelines for this. Yeah, it's a good question. I have another talk on that that I'm going to hopefully give you guys later in the week. Um, I mean, it's it's I won't I won't go into it in too much detail because of that. But it's it's look, it's contentious. There's no hard and fast rules, and there's some there's a few sort of flow sheets you, you know you can look at obviously if it's an emergency surgery then you, you do it and you you know you you can't really not do it if it's elective surgery then there's a bunch of other factors you look at and um, I'll go through them in my talk but the main things are you know if the child has a fever if the child is has systemic features are they lethargic are they tired have they not been eating um, and and if the child has has um, any anything like a wheeze um, that's that is not get clearing with coughing, um, to suggesting a lower respiratory tract infection, those are the, the sort of the major factors that will make you more likely to postpone. Um, but um, at the end of the day, when you become a consultant, you can do whatever you want. Uh, no one's going to um, stop you um, whether you postpone or, or proceed. Um, but you know, the, I think it depends on a whole lot of other factors too, and I'll talk about that hopefully when I give you the, the talk on it. But you know, if it's a, if it's something like grommets, ear tubes, it's a five-minute operation. You don't need to instrument the airway most of the time. If the kid, unless the kid's at death's door, we're going to do it. Whereas if it's something more more like tonsils or a laparotomy, then you know you're more likely to, put, to postpone. But I'll, I'll 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 go into more detail with the with the talk and hopefully give you some guidelines. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's good to have a lecture on that. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so I'll, I'll just finish off last night's talk. Um, we, so remember, we talked about pyloric stenosis, and and remember that um, that a lot of these kids are coming in the newborn period. And that's one of the reasons why uh, apnea is common and we don't give them opioids unless they really earn it. Um, the, um, but these kids are staying in hospital, so, you know, they're not like the elective well, healthy ones. So we had one of these cases, I think, last week at Rafidia, um, Exomphilus. Unfortunately, I was at the Kuwaiti hospital, so I, I wasn't there. But uh, these are interesting cases. And... Um, and there's a few things we need to remember when we get one of these cases, um, and that's what I just want to run through. So exomphilus is abdominal viscera herniating to the base of the umbilicus, also called an omphilus seal. Exomphilus, omphilus seal, that's the same thing. And uh, that's, these are just pictures. Uh, this is what they what a silo is. So when they say they put the kitty in a silo, that's a silo to, to protect it and, and um and I talk, I'll talk about that later on and why we do that. But you can see that's elevated. It's not pressing on the kid's tummy, not affecting their breathing, and it's keeping the, the bowel clean. 
and this is gastroschisis. Gastroschisis is um, so on for the still it's it's in the umbilical cord. Oops, and uh, it's still covered in amniotic. Um, it's still in the in the, in, the, in the bowel sac covered by peritoneum. Gastroschisis it's exposed directly to the um, amniotic fluid and, and the bowel actually just pokes out and is exposed to the air. So what are the differences? So omphalocele, herniation of the intestine into the base of the umbilical cord. So it can occur above or below the umbilicus, but it's usually into the base of the umbilical cord. So it's like a massive umbilical cord basically. Peritoneal sac is always present, but it can rupture during, during birth. But what that means is the bowel is protected from the amniotic fluid and protected from the air. If, um, gastroschisis, usually herniation comes out lateral to the umbilical cord and the herniation comes out through a defect in the abdominal wall as opposed to the umbilical cord. And there's no sac covering it, so the bowel is exposed to amniotic fluid and to air. So that, that means uh, it's more prone to, to damage if it's not fixed immediately. Both are usually diagnosed antenatally on the 18-week ultrasound. So, um, just just to, to compare, the, the incidence um, on for the seal is slightly more common, 1 in 6,000 to 1 in 10,000 versus 1 in 20,000 to 1 in 30,000 with gastroschisis. Male to female ratio is the same. Uh, gastroschisis is just bowel, whereas in the seal can have all sorts of other stuff in it like um, liver, spleen, gonads. Um, the sac protects the bowel, which is usually functionally normal. Um, 25 to 30% of these babies have uh, a preterm or low birth weight, and, and up to two-thirds have uh, associated abnormalities. And, and generally, their mortality is determined by these associated abnormalities, not by um, the omphalocele itself, which is usually treatable. So the, <clears throat> the, the, the most common uh, abnormalities... Um, uh, cardiac, and that's tetralogy of fallow is the most common of those. Uh, they can have all sorts of funny intestinal things like malrotation, intestinal atresia, perfid anus. Uh, they can have bladder extrophy and get craniofacial uh, problems. Um, whereas gastroschisis, associated abnormalities are much less common. So the way I remember these is, is if there's an omphalocele, that's good for the bowel, but bad for the baby. Whereas if it's gastroschisis, it's bad for the bowel, but good for the baby. Meaning that if you fix the gastroschisis, these kids tend to do pretty well. Omphalocele, if you fix the omphalocele, there's often other abnormalities that determine this child's outcome. So when you get a, a baby with this omphalocele or gastroschisis, you need to to try and remember, uh, we need to ask what else has this kid got. And if it's a gastroschisis, I usually relax a little because I think, okay, it's unlikely they're going to have something else nasty. Whereas when it's an omphalocele, they could have a lot of things, as you can see here. And uh, and so it's important to ask the surgeon what comorbidities they have and never believe them when they say none because uh, often they haven't had an echo yet. So you usually really want to see an echo on these on these on for the seal kids before you put them to sleep. Um, and you know it's 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 urgent, but it's not um, crazy urgent. You know they don't have to do it straight out of the womb. You've got to you know you could often do it the next day or the day after. Um, so. Um, Ideally, you want to make sure you've spoken to the paediatrician or the neonatologist to find out what other abnormalities these babies have. So, um, preoperatively, uh, what do they do? Well, you want to protect the, the hernia, so they cover them with a sterile dressing or a plastic bag to prevent heat loss because obviously if your bowel's out, you lose a lot of heat, you lose a lot of fluid and you can get infection and you also get damaged. The bowel dries out and, and, and damages the bowel. So so they cover it in this, this plastic thing called a silo. It's like a that photo I showed you earlier. I'll go back. Um, just, oops, just so you can see it. It's like a massive uh, plastic bag here and it keeps it kind of moist and protected, kind of like what you do with uh, food in the refrigerator. Um so, um, so when the baby's born, uh, they pass a nasogastric tube to decompress the bowel, and then they they protect the hernial contents. And then um, once it's in a silo, there's no huge rush. You know, you've got to do it over days, um, but uh, but hopefully the bowel is, is reasonably protected. And the and the surgeons 
Uh, they, if there's a sac present, they excise it, they stretch the abdominal wall and they replace the contents and they ideally do a primary closure um, and they, 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 they stuff everything back in basically and they close it. But often the primary closure is not possible. You, you, sometimes these are very big um, defects and, and because the baby's never had them in there, the abdomen just doesn't have the room. So you've got to basically make room and, and stretch up the abdomen and that takes a few days. So... Um, so often these children come back for multiple procedures, like they'll, they'll stuff a bit in, keep it in the silo, um, bring them back in a couple of days, stuff a bit more in. And, and usually these children are then uh, intubated and ventilated for the duration of this. And I'll talk about why in a minute. So but when we assess these children, it's important that we assess volume status. Generally, if they're coming from the, the NICU, the NICU doctors have done a good job in putting a drip in and giving this baby some fluid because obviously they're, they're nil by mouth. And sometimes they'll even be on uh, TPN, so they will be getting uh, glucose and, 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 and um, volume. Obviously, we have to assess for coexisting abnormalities because, as we've seen, that some of these children have a high incidence of, of abnormalities other than the bowel. It's worth seeing what their hemoglobin is, their electrolytes and their sugar, particularly um, uh, if they're on uh, TPN. These children are often anemic because, remember, some of them are preterm, some of them are low birth weight. They're in NICU, they're getting blood samples, all of those risk factors we talked about. Um, so there is a risk of um, anemia. So it's important to have blood available because they, uh, they don't have to lose a lot of blood before we need to give blood. And generally these operations, they don't bleed a lot, but these kitties can get quite dry and hypotensive, particularly if the bowel is exposed. It's, it's very nice to have an echo, especially if it's exomphalous. And uh, generally, um, as I said, they often do a stage repair. So um, as it like that, that plastic bag thing, like it's a plastic prosthesis, they, they stick that over the bowel, they tape to the edges, and they close it over seven to 10 days. BSL is a blood sugar level in the bar. Um, so now the abdominal cavity is underdeveloped, as I said, and they, they're trying to put it in. I don't know if you guys uh, have ever tried to put a sleeping bag in a really tight sleeping bag cover, but uh, it's, it's kind of like that. You've got this really tight space and you're trying to stuff all this bowel in without putting it under pressure because if you stuff it all in, and put the bowel under pressure, things in the, in the abdomen can get ischemic. And you also push up on the diaphragm, and that causes respiratory embarrassment and, and it's hard to ventilate these babies. So um, so we get a whole bunch of consequences from the raised intra-abdominal pressure. We get restricted diaphragmatic movement. We can get lung compression. We can get inferior vena cava compression, which reduces venous return and reduces cardiac output and reduces blood pressure. Uh, we can get bowel ischemia, and we can even get wind margin ischemia. So these are things that they monitor closely for up on the, the, the neonatal intensive care. And one of my surgeons basically says, said to me, what he does is starts pushing it back into the abdomen until I complain. So when I say to him, uh, having real trouble with the ventilation now, he'll, he'll, he'll stop. Um, so um, so these, these are things, uh, I just put this, these risk factors here uh, because it's something we need to just be aware of, but the main one we need to be aware of is first two, okay? And the IVC compression maybe as well, but um, you know we may need to give these babies some volume. So I always have some 5% albumin uh, for these cases, but um, uh, we need to warm the room and prevent hypothermia. So remember yesterday we talked about the mechanisms we can do, we can use to do that, warm room, uh, underbody bear hugger or some sort of warming blanket. We have an overhead warmer. Um, as well while we're putting lines in and, and while the surgeon is scrubbing and prepping before um, because this kitty has their bowel exposed uh, and, and they can lose a lot of heat that way. So that's very important um, and uh, cover the child up. Often these babies, if they're small, we put a, a um, I don't know what you call a, um, a hat, like a, in Australia we call it a beanie, like a winter hat. Um, we put a balaclava over the baby's head, keep the head warm. And then uh, well, as soon as the drapes are on, we, um, um, we, we, we um, re we'll remove the um, overhead heater, but we, we make sure we keep the child warm. And if we're going to use albumin or something like that, we, we use warmed albumin. Aspirate the nasogastric tube. Uh, we can 
breathe them down or do an intravenous induction. It doesn't really matter. But ideally, um, um, I, I mean, I often breathe these kids down because I just get nervous when they're so small um, and that keeps them spontaneously breathing. Muscle relaxant is, is useful, very useful, because the surgeon needs to stretch up the abdominal cavity. So if they're paralyzed, it's easier It's easier for them. It's also easier for us to assess airway uh, or lung compliance because if the patient isn't paralyzed and we, we have trouble with our ventilation pressures, sometimes it's because the baby is starting to breathe and fight the ventilator. Uh, sometimes it's because the surgeon's pushing too much bowel into the abdomen. So uh, if you paralyze them, you take that out of the picture. And most of the, these children, we're not extubating. And this is a very small hernia. We're leaving them intubated. So we can give opioid, we can give paralysis, and uh, we don't have to worry too much about them breathing afterwards because they're going to the intensive care on a ventilator. And one of the reasons for that is, is um, as I mentioned, they, they're going to have some respiratory embarrassment. It's going to be hard for them to breathe spontaneously because um, there's all this pressure on their diaphragm. So we ventilate them, we support them until the abdomen stretches up and they get used to having their abdominal contents back inside. So, um, as I mentioned, um, we're watching the airway pressures. Often we'll go to the handbag and just see what it feels like, um, but lung compliance can fall. Uh, we, what we see is a rise in the pressures or a fall in our volume if we're doing pressure control, and we might have to increase the PEEP. Um, and I always give these babies PEEP because they're at high risk of atelectasis. And if and our FiO2 may, may 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 creep up because they might desaturate from the atelectasis caused by what the surgeon is doing. Um, okay, so basically, it's a, it's an operation where it's 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 good to be watching what the surgeon's doing and the ventilator, and that's the main thing with these cases. The things that you, you need to remember is temperature and fluid because they they can lose both quickly and uh, ventilation and, and watch what's happening with the ventilation and talk to the surgeon and tell them I'm having trouble so the surgeon knows to stop. Uh, so once we're asleep, we give some opioid and if we're not extubating, we can give a big dose of fentanyl and then I give them not much gas. Um, but if, if I am extubating, then I'll, I'll, um, I'll give a little bit of, uh, a little less fentanyl, one to two micrograms per kilogram and um, morphine or morphine, um, a small dose of morphine if they need it. Um, avoid nitrous oxide because that causes um, intestinal distension and obviously that will make it harder for the surgeon to put it back in the abdomen. I mentioned that they can lose a lot of fluid so we just need to pay close attention to that. Arterial line may be useful. Um, some of these kids get umbilical lines put in if it's a gastroschisis. If it's an omphalocele obviously they can't because it's part of the hernia. Um, but it's, it's useful if it's a really big defect because uh, then when, when you get re getting problems with, with respiration or you're not sure how your respiration is going, you can do a blood gas and if you see you're not ventilating well, then the surgeon can back off a bit. But I have to confess I've done quite a few of these without arterial lines if it's not such a big defect and the child is otherwise healthy. Uh, we may need to put, be asked to put a central line in uh, for, for total parental nutrition uh, if necessary, but again, often the, the neonatologists are good at getting long lines in the baby for this purpose. And how these babies do post-operatively, uh, it largely depends on how big the defect is, uh, how they've gone when it's been reduced in terms of the pressures and the abdomen and the lungs, how uh, preterm they are, and what abnormalities they have. Um, so uh, early extubation is possible, as I said, if it's a small defect and they're otherwise well. And uh, you can consider doing a caudal epidural, like so slipping a caudal catheter in, if they're, it's likely you're going to extubate within 48 hours, uh, just for analgesia to help with their breathing. But I've never, I've only done really either really small and we're extubating within a day or so, or or big ones where they stay in ICU. So I've never, I've never had uh, had to do that. And we otherwise we keep them on a morphine infusion uh, in the neonatal intensive care. The problem is if you give opioids like or morphine infusion and they've extubated, they'll almost certainly have apnea. So they really need to be intubated for that. As I mentioned, they might need TPN. And they get close assessment of fluid requirements up in the NICU. Um, they can have problems with ventilation. And again, that's something that 
um, is it going to be communication between the surgeon, the neonatal doctors, and, and I guess us? And uh, you know, rarely they can they can get really sick if it's a really um, really big defect and they get intra raised intra-abdominal pressure. They can be having impaired cardiac output and and occasionally they do need inotropes. Uh, touch wood, I haven't had to do one of these yet. Um, uh, so yeah, Ruby, you're asking about the caudal. Um, I would feed a caudal catheter, so I would put the caudal catheter in and feed it up to sort of um, low thoracic high lumbar and run an infusion. But if you're going to do that, you need to really do it with ultrasound. The reality is you need a, a unit, a neonatal unit that's going to be proactive and extubate the baby if you're going to do that technique because there's no point putting a caudal catheter in if they're going to keep the baby intubated for several days. And it often it depends a lot on how things are going. If things are going really well, then it might be a reasonable technique. If things are going uh, not so well and they're going to be intubated for a long time, then, then you, wouldn't, you wouldn't do it. Um, but, yeah, if feeding caudal catheters up ideally should be done with ultrasound because otherwise you don't really know where it's going. It can go off to one side or, or the other. But you can, you can get in a small baby, you can get a caudal catheter well up into the thoracic level. So you you can put it in either using an epidural needle or a, or a or a normal cannula and then feed the catheter like a normal epidural catheter and just feed it up. But you have to do it with a completely sterile technique. So I use um, if I'm doing a portal catheter, I use gloves, gown, mask, and spool scrub, and do it like I'm doing a, a, an operative epidural. Uh, so I have just two more quick topics, short topics, um, before we finish this talk. And um, post tonsillectomy uh, bleed. Um, no, uh, sorry, Ruby, just to answer your question. Um, well, it depends where the um, the lesion is. Obviously, it's at the umbilicus, it's T10, so you would need to feed it up up higher up. Um, any other questions on on that? I, again, like I, I mean, a caudal catheter is is um, it's a, you know it's it's rare you tend to do it because usually these kids go stay intubated for a few days, and so there's there's no point. And if it's a really small defect, it might be overkill. So yeah, I mean I have never done it for this. I've done it for other operations. Any other questions? Baha, you have a question? Oh yeah, I thought I answered Baha's question. What is BSL? That's blood sugar level. Any any other any other questions on on gastroschisis and exomphalus? It's it's not that common. Um, they seem to come in runs, but often you'll have one child coming back every couple of days, so you'll get to know them well. And if you have a good surgeon that's conservative, it's not usually a, a, a huge problem as long as the child doesn't have other comorbidities. If the child has a lot of comorbidities, then it can be a deeply stressful experience every two days anesthetizing these children. Okay, if there are no more questions on this, I'll... Um, just talk quickly about post tonsillectomy bleed because it's a, it's a topic that uh, it's not neonatal um, and the next two aren't really neonatal but they're common pediatric topics that I, I wanted to fit in somewhere and this seemed like the best place. Post tonsillectomy bleed is, is something that makes many anaesthetists go very pale and get very nervous about. Um, and that's because they, they, these kids can bleed a lot and bleeding into the airway is, is obviously very uh, challenging. So um, the most common indications for tonsillectomy are obstructive sleep apnea and, and recurrent tonsillitis. And um, when we assess these children, uh, <clears throat> it's important that we that we work out which one they're having done because if they have sleep apnea that that changes things a little bit in terms of uh, titration of our, our analgesia because these children are more sensitive to opioids 
they're more sensitive to the respiratory depressant effect of opioids, and they're also uh, more sensitive to benzodiazepines, and they're more likely to obstruct in recovery. So if they have sleep apnea, I don't give them midazolam. I, I, I try and minimize the sedating drugs I give these children um, because I don't want them to be obstructing in, in the recovery room. So when you assess, when you take the history, you ask the parents why they're having it done, but it's important to ask them if they actually have sleep apnea, they've never had a sleep study, do they snore, do they stop breathing at night, have they ever turned blue, are they difficult to rouse in the morning, do they have daytime somnolence or a history of hyperactivity. ADD is attention deficit disorder. So in children, um, you might remember from your pediatrics, sleep apnea um, often is, is, is attributed to uh, attention deficit disorder. These children are tired at school and so they don't pay attention and they're diagnosed with ADD. Uh, but it's often because they're not sleeping well at night. And they're, so often they won't have had a sleep study and the parents won't, won't know that they have sleep apnea. So that's why it's important to ask about these symptoms because these symptoms might mean, okay, they, they might have sleep apnea and, and, you have to, and if you think they might, then you have to treat them like they do because it's better to be on the safe side. So, as I said, I avoid it if it's for OSA. If they have tonsillitis, then I'm happy to give. Uh, whether you, I mean, whether you put them off to sleep intravenously or, or with inhalational induction doesn't matter. In, where I work, we, we do an inhalational induction and put an intravenous access in when the child is already asleep. And I, uh, so normally I'll give one microgram per kilogram of fentanyl to these kids. If it's um, if it's a um, sleep apnea kid, I, I have that, and I'm more conservative. Uh, I'll give more if they need it, but uh, I let them earn it. And, and I mean, I see a tachycardia, I see tachypnea, or they're very uncomfortable in recovery, and then I give more. But otherwise, my standard uh, for a tonsillectomy is one microgram per kilogram of fentanyl a non-steroidal paracetamol and 100 mics per kilo of morphine. And I have the fentanyl and the morphine dose for the severe sleep apnea kids. If they have severe sleep apnea, uh, we know that kids with sleep apnea, like adults with sleep apnea, are at higher risk of apneas and obstruction post-op, so they need overnight SATS monitoring. So that's also important to why we need to know if they have, um, if they, if they have sleep apnea or not. Uh, I give them all anti-emetics. I usually give dexamethasone, 0.1 to 0.15 milligrams per kilogram, and at the end I give on Dancitron. But if you don't have on Dancitron, you, you can give some, something else, um, Maxilon or drop, Droperidol. At the end of the case, uh, it's important to suction the pharynx under direct vision. So I always put my laryngoscope in, I look, make sure there is no blood in the tonsillar fossa, and then it's always good to flex the head and let any blood that's fallen behind the um, soft palate come down. That blood's often called the coronary clot because the child is is uh, on their back. The blood rolls under the soft palate. Then uh, you extubate the child. They sit up in recovery, and that clot falls down on the vocal cords, and they can laryngospasm and obstruct. And uh, that's why they call it the coronary clot. So it's important to suction under the under the pharynx as well and remove that blood. And I extubate all my tonsils on the side, um, so hopefully if there is any, any blood that keeps tripping down there, it, it runs out of their, their mouth. When these kids come back for a post-tonsillectomy bleed, it tends to be, um, it's, it's either early, like about the same day because of inadequate hemostasis on the part of the surgeon, or it's at seven to ten days from infection. And um, often the child's been swallowing blood a lot before they start vomiting blood, and then it's when they start vomiting blood that that people realize that they're being bleeding. So often they can contain a lot more blood than we realize, which means they're often a lot more anemic and hypotensive than we realize. And so it's important to have uh, uh, have awareness of this and have volume ready to give these kids. Um, some of these kids have a post-tonsillectomy bleed. Uh, because they actually have a coagulopathy that hasn't been diagnosed. So uh, that's something to keep in the back of your mind. But basically, when we assess these children, we have to assess their volume status, their vital signs, make sure we have a hemoglobin. We must have an IV access before we, we put them off to sleep, and ideally uh, coagulation studies. They must be resuscitated before they come to the operating room, so we don't 
uh, cause cause their blood pressure to to drop rapidly when we induce them. And we really need an assistant. This isn't the case you want to do by yourself. You want a technician that you trust, or if there's another doctor to help you, a second a second doctor. That's ideal to have two doctors, one for drugs and one for airway. And you need a, you need a good plan with your airway for these kids because. Um, if you've ever tried to intubate someone with blood in their mouth, and I'm sure a lot of you have had that experience, it's very difficult because the blood absorbs the, the light of your laryngoscope blade and you, and it's really hard to see anything. So you really want a good plan and you might only get one or two shots at it before things uh, get very messy for you. So, um, so set up for a rapid sequence induction. They say you should have two functioning large bore suctions and water to clean them if, if they get blocked because if the child is really bleeding and they block, um, you should have some water available. You should have two laryngoscopes. One, interestingly, you should always have two laryngoscopes that work on your on your anesthetic machine, but I know in a lot of our hospitals we don't. But you want two um, because if one uh, doesn't work, you want another one. You want all monitoring on before you go to sleep. These children, usually if, if they're really sick, they're not going to fight you too much. So you get your ECG on, get your pulse oximeter on, get your blood pressure on. Pre-oxygenate them sitting up, 100% oxygen, for for as long as as, um, as you need. So you want a good three or four-minute pre-oxygenation. And if you can't sit them up, then put them in the left lateral position. Um, and then and, and then induce them. When you induce them, then you can lie them down. And induction drugs, whatever you, you feel comfortable with for inducing a, a shocked patient. And look, they're not always going to be shocks. Uh, sometimes it's, it's, it's just a minor bleed. Sometimes they've just bit their tongue from the um, local anesthetic that the surgeon's injected. But we always prepare for the worst. So propofol or thiopentone or ketamine. Cricoid pressure is very important here. And... Scoline is the drug I would always use. You could use rock uranium, uh, uh, like a 1, 1 1.2 milligrams per kilogram of rock uranium. But if you can't intubate that child and you've used a huge dose of rock uranium, you're going to find yourself in, uh, in a bit of trouble. So um, I think that we were talking about this today, actually. We had a very interesting conversation about this today in, in um, Al Ahali Hospital. We don't have scoline in Al Ahali. Um, and um, that's uh, unfortunate, uh, and a lot of people don't like scolding, but I think there's certain cases where I think many of us, it would be our first choice, and I think this is one of them, uh, because I think at least if you can't intubate the child, hopefully uh, they will start breathing again um, if you use um, if you use scolding. Um, so a good dose of scolding, so they say two milligrams per kilogram to make sure that you, it's enough, but you know, one and a half should be should be fine. Um, cuff tube, ideally, because you want a protected airway. And there's two options, or you could stylet the tube um, or have a bougie. My, my approach would probably be, I would, I would just have a, have a bougie there ready to go because your first look is gonna be your best look, um, especially if you're sucking, sucking, sucking. You're gonna to have to, at some point, remove the suction to get a view, so you've probably got a few seconds before it could get bloody again. At least if you have a bougie, you get a view, you put the bougie straight in. If you don't have a bougie, then I would definitely start at the tube um, because you don't want to have a look go, oh, it's a little anterior, come out, have to put the stylet in. So um, so I would I would prepare one of the, the two of those. Um, and then once I've got the tube in, pass an orogastric tube, suck the blood out of the stomach, and then proceed as you would for a normal tonsil, and then you want to extubate this child wide awake and uh, ideally on their side and check a hemoglobin postoperatively. Any questions about that? Have any of you guys had a good going um, post tonsillectomy bleed? And if so, do you want to tell the rest of the group how you did it? Is everyone still awake? <laughs> I've touched wood, I've never had a bad one. I've had a couple 
where we've got everything ready and, and they've been really boring. There's been like a tiny bit of blood. And, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I have had to intubate people with blood in the airway. Uh, so I, I have a, some appreciation for the difficulty. Uh, yeah. Tell me about it, Ruba. If you, you hate the song in the background, imagine listening to it with everyone smoking shisha around you. But unfortunately, it's the best internet I've got. Um, so this is uh, this is the last um, couple of slides here, and this is just again another topic that I just wanted to finish on um, because it's another important pediatric topic, and it's a common thing we see in kids. And I'm sure most of you, have, if you've been doing anaesthetics for a few years, have, have done one of these. Um, Aspirated foreign bodies. It's, it's very common in um, in this toddler age group, and so it's important if you have done, haven't done one to have an approach and, and think about um, how you would do it. And again, they can be very stressful cases. Um, they're stressful because it's a shared airway. These children can have respiratory distress and uh, can have a partial airway obstruction which can become complete during the case and um, that can be very scary. So the important thing is to maintain spontaneous ventilation in these children because if, if you remove that and you, you, you positive pressure ventilate them, you could force whatever the foreign body is further into the airway and, and make it harder to remove or cause a partial obstruction to become a complete obstruction. Uh, you get everything ready as if you're going to intubate the child in case, but obviously you, you don't intubate because you're going to hand the airway over to the to the surgeon. And so sometimes these children can present as a, as, a, as a suspected esophageal foreign body. So I had one of these a, a few weeks ago before I, I, I came to Palestine um, where they, they thought it was esophageal. And it was only that the ENT surgeon... Um, heard a little bit of wheeze when he was assessing the child, uh, not wheeze, stridor, that made him think twice about whether or not it was esophageal or tracheal, and, and in fact it was tracheal, and hopefully I have a photo of that here. Um, but um, what can you do to help distinguish? Well, obviously you assess the child, you take a history uh, about um, what happened and, and, and what, what made the parents bring the child in, whether the child was coughing or vomiting or dry retching. Often they do both. That's why it can be confusing. Um, and, and you assess, look for respiratory distress, listen for, for wheeze or stridor. Uh, and the, they can do a chest X-ray. And a chest X-ray may show the foreign body. If it's a coin or something like that, it will show up. Uh, often it won't be a radio-opaque foreign body. Uh, but if it's in the lung, you might see hyperinflation on, on the affected side. If there is a, um, um, if it's a uh, right main bronchus or left main bronchus uh, foreign body, you can get like a ball valve effect. So they breathe in, the air gets into the lung, but it gets blocked coming out the other way. And so they get hyperinflation on that side. Or they can get atelectasis on that side. Um, and if it's been there for a long time, they can have significant atelectasis and pneumonia. So this chest x-ray uh, is one from a child we, we anesthetized in Ethiopia and that was this child's story. This child had a history of about a week of foreign body and you can see this is the, the trachea, this is the, the right main and the left main bronchus and you can see that this child has, has a complete consolidation collapse on that side and that's because they had an obstructed bronchus from a, um, it was like a part of a pencil that they'd um, inhaled. This is another x-ray from Ethiopia, and this is a right main bronchus foreign body. It's actually the part of an, a TV aerial, the old aerials on televisions, like we call them bunny ears. Uh, somehow the child managed to inhale that. Um, I don't know how. This is this is the carina here, the trachea. Um, good thing was it was very easy to get out, but I, I still to this day can't work out how the child managed to inhale that unless they were practicing to be a sword swallower. But some important principles for these is so you prepare like you're going to intubate, you have everything ready, have the appropriate size tube, you're all your emergency drugs, the ringoscope, and uh, do not commence until the surgeon has uh, their rigid bronchoscope ready because in the rare event that when you put this child off to sleep, they obstruct, the surgeon can 
can put his rigid bronchoscope in and push whatever's in there down under vision into the right or left main bronchus and then at least you can ventilate the other side until you try and get the um, the offending uh, foreign body out. Most people would say you should do an inhalational induction to get the child off to sleep with halothane or sevoflurane. This is one of the few times where halothane is better than sevoflurane and the reason for that is that sevoflurane is, is a less soluble, faster onset, faster offset. So you might get the child deep enough for a for the rigid bronchoscopy, but if the surgeon is not very quick at getting their rigid bronchoscope in, then um, what can happen is that as the child continues to breathe, they breathe off the sevoflurane, the child lightens up, and then uh, they can they can start to, to cough and buck on the bronchoscope. Whereas halothane being longer acting, the child stays deeper for longer, and it's actually the perfect uh, volatile for this procedure. Once asleep, you should obtain intravenous access if they don't have it. So the textbooks will tell you that if a child comes in with a with an airway foreign body, don't put an IV access in in the in the emergency department. Do it in the operating room when the child is asleep. And the reason for that is that if the child gets distressed, the fear is that they convert a partial obstruction into a complete obstruction. So it's better that we. Um, breathe the child down nice and calmly with the parents present, escort the parents out and put an IV access in. Sometimes these children look so well and, and or it's thought to be an esophageal foreign body and intravenous access is obtained and if we have it, that's great. It means we can do a co-induction or we can still gas them down or we can just run a propofol TIVA. It makes life uh, easier. But the textbook teaching and the exam answer is you put your IV access in when the child is sleep. I give a, a bigger dose of dexamethasone, 0.5 to 0.6 milligrams per kilogram, because you're giving it as an anti-inflammatory dose. So that's a dose you would give for croup, uh, and hopefully that helps with any airway swelling the foreign body or the bronchoscopy is going to cause. And the books will suggest glycopyrrolate, 10 mics per kilo, or atropine, 20 mics per kilo, and that's for um, as an anti sialog to reduce secretions and saliva, make it easier for the surgeon. And then um, you're, uh, once you've got the child deeply anesthetized and obtain intravenous access, you should do a gentle laryngoscopy and spray the cords with lignocaine. And they say with these cases, when you think the child is deep enough, wait another minute before doing this because you really don't want this child to laryngospasm. This is not a child where you can paralyze and tube them and, and everything's going to be okay because remember the obstruction is often distal. And then spray the cords, replace the mask, wait two or three minutes, and then hand the OA over to the surgeon. Let the surgeon insert their rigid bronchoscope and then attach the circuit to the side arm. Uh, that's, so the most common technique would be gas. Um, alternative techniques are listed there. My technique is gas them down and switch them to propofol. Um, Probably for 200 micrograms per kilogram per minute, and you can add if you want ketamine, or you can add alfentanil, or you can add remifentanil. My technique is I put 20 milligrams of ketamine in a 20 mil syringe of propofol, so it's one milligram per mil, and I run the I run the um, propofol at 200 micrograms per kilogram per minute on a syringe pump, and then I can bolus with um, straight propofol in a different syringe if I if I think the child is getting light. Um, but when I do that technique, I like to give it the child five minutes on that, at least on that propofol for the propofol to get on board before I let the surgeon do anything to the airway. And if they are getting light, I can still supplement with um, with sevoflurane or, or halothane, whatever you have. And um, I um, I often um, give a bit of fentanyl as well, usually half a mic per kilogram. Um, I, I don't give more than that uh, at a time. Um, I might give more over all the case, but I don't want to give one mic per kilo because they might go apneic. And once they go apneic, it makes life a bit more difficult for you. So this is just a picture of the rigid bronchoscope, called often called the Stortz bronchoscope. So that's the part going into the child's airway. Uh, that's the surgical suction. That's the surgeon where he puts his camera and his grasping devices. And this is the side arm, and this is attached to our circuit, which in this case was a T piece, and we were right, we were running halothane. But if you you can run sevoflurane, or you can run oxygen, and 100% oxygen. If you are, uh, I always give 100% oxygen in these cases because I want to maximise my uh, oxygenation. And often these kids will desaturate because even though they're spontaneously breathing, 
they're still hypoventilating because they're so deeply anesthetized. So, uh, it, at least if you if you're not running gas, then uh, you don't have to worry about the surgeon getting a headache from uh, from your gas. So, um, continue to let the child spontaneously breathe. Make sure you're looking at the chest and abdominal movement, and you can see that they're breathing well. Because um, obviously, you can't always get a reliable capnography. You may need to assist uh, through the bronchoscope. Uh, so you can see from here, when the telescope is in there, there's going to be a lot of resistance for the child to breathe. So you often do need to assist. And when the surgeon takes his instruments out, if you're assisting, they should close this. There's a little thing they can put over the top so, so you can assist better. Otherwise, it'll just leak out. Um, as I mentioned, you can supplement with propofol if you need to. It's nice to have a precordial stethoscope. We don't really use them anymore in Australia, but when I was in Ethiopia, they used them all the time. And then you can hear air entry. So if you can't see what's going on because the um, child's tidal volumes are small or the child's covered up, uh, you can at least hear. I mentioned the dexamethasone already. Keep, we usually keep them nil by mouth for anywhere. There's no hard and fast rules anywhere from... An, an hour after to two hours after the spraying their cords of lignocaine. They need to be, uh, be observed in recovery for strider afterwards and ideally a chest x-ray post-op because pneumothorax is a complication and they stay in overnight, no question. You really want to observe these kids, make sure they don't develop stridal. If they do develop stridal, the management is, um, is obviously going to be CPAP in the first instance so you can hold a bit of CPAP, see if they improve. Uh, dexamethasone if you haven't given it now's the time to give it and um, then the next step would be a nebulized adrenaline um, half a milligram per kilogram up to about four four milligrams and then uh, if they're still having severe stridor oops uh, then um, you um, um, sorry I just lost the, um, my place but uh, then uh, you can reintubate them if you have to but that's hopefully very rare I've never had to do that Anyway, that brings us to the end. Thank you for your attention. I hope uh, some of those topics um, were useful. Um, and I, I have a couple more on a different night we'll do, but um, that's quite a long talk. Any questions about any of that or any comments? Yes, he, he developed a pneumothorax and then he got surgical emphysema. So I was thinking if the intubation might uh, increase the positive pressure in the lungs and increase and worsen the emphysema. It will, but um, uh, like I said, that child, it was a child, it was a child, uh, it was a foreign body, it was a uh, trachea foreign body and uh, and the child, uh, we extubated the child, he was maintaining his airway. Uh, um, and uh, for about two days. And uh, the, it was a very sad case actually because two days later, he uh, developed a fever. And it turned out that uh, he had uh, post obstructive pneumonitis because the surgeon had missed. It was a peanut. Uh. Well, it was a peanut, and he broke it up. And unfortunately, the child, uh, after two days, uh, deteriorated to the point where he had to be reintubated. And uh, like it happens in Rwanda uh, very frequently, he was intubated, and uh, they put it in the SMU. And then at about two o'clock in the morning, the tube fell out and uh, the child died. Jeez. Was that in Chuck, uh, Hafez, or in Butari? Sorry? Was it, which, which hospital was that in? Chuck. Chuck. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah as, as, as you may know, Kigali is. Uh, uh, ICU is kind of marginal there. Yeah, marginal. There, there were two nurses that were very good, but the rest of them. Really, yes. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, the tube was dislodged. The tube was dislodged. The nurse didn't uh, recognize that the tube was dislodged until the child arrested. Right. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a problem. And it is a problem with the foreign body. Like a peanut is the worst foreign body to get because, as Hafez said, they can break up. And some, I think some of the oil on the peanut as well causes pneumonitis. And they're very slippery little suckers. Yeah, they're the worst foreign bodies to get. Um, like the ones I've had, I had um, – well, I showed you two of them. I had um, one uh, which was like a pen lid, and that wasn't too bad because it was it would be removed in one hit. Food is also really bad because it you've got to pick it out bit by bit. That photo I showed you, the bronchoscope, I think was um, a kid who'd had uh, some beans or something stuck in his airway. So, yeah, they're, they're the more difficult ones. The other thing I was going to say, I forgot to say, so when you wake these children up, you often don't need – to intubate them, you can just leave their spontaneously breathing, leave them on their, uh, put them on their side. But if they're not fasted, I think a lot of people would say it's 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 safest to intubate them and wake them up and pull the tube out because then you um, you don't have to run the risk of aspiration. So otherwise, obviously, there's a risk of aspiration throughout the case. But at least if you've got a bronchoscope in, you can see if anything's leaking down into the airway. What do you do, Hafiz? Yeah. Do, you, do you intubate them? I, I usually put them on their side and just let them, uh, yes, let them wake up. Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, uh, the other question uh, that I was going to ask you, and I now forgot it. It's not... Uh, uh, oh, gosh. I'll come back to me. Never mind. Okay. 